Hi, I'm Timothy Farkas. I'm a senior software engineer at Netflix on the Flink team. Today I'm going to be talking about auto-scaling Flink jobs here at Netflix. So auto-scaling is a very broad topic. I want to define the problem we focused on solving first because we created an auto-scaling solution for a very specific type of Flink job. So what was our pain point? What was the problem we were trying to solve? Well, the stream processing team here manages thousands of simple Flink jobs for customers throughout Netflix. We call these simple Flink jobs routers, and they just consume from a single Kafka topic, potentially do a projection or filter operation, and then write the results to a sync. So all of these jobs are stateless, and the jobs don't do any shuffles. All the operators are chained together in a single subtask. It's a very simple job. So the problem was we were responsible for managing these jobs for all these customers and there are thousands of them. And managing the job meant making sure the job scaled with traffic. So every time there was a traffic spike or a traffic increase, we had to make sure the clusters would scale. And originally we were doing this manually. So we had these thousands of jobs, we could get paged uh, if a cluster started falling behind, and then we would have to go manually scale it up. So we wanted to automate this process. So I want to go into describing a solution. And before I do that, I want to define some terminology uh, about the problem. So the first term is workload. I'm defining workload as events being produced to a Kafka topic. And a workload has two main characteristics the message rate, and also the size of the messages. The other term is lag. I'm defining lag as the time it would take for a router to process all of the messages that are buffered in its Kafka topic. The other term is a healthy router. So I'm defining a router as being healthy if its lag is approximately five minutes or less. Now, given these terms, what do I define as an auto-scaling solution? I'm saying an auto-scaling solution is something that adjusts the number of nodes in the router uh, dynamically uh, with the workload in order to ensure that the router is always in a healthy state. And it does this in a way that attempts to use the smallest number of nodes possible. So that's my definition of what a solution looks like. Now, there are many possible solutions that you could implement. And the key thing to remember is there is no perfect solution. You will always be able to take any solution you come up with and find a workload that defeats it. So you can actually prove this uh, semi-mathematically with the following argument, that if you take any auto-scaling algorithm A and provide it with a workload W that does the exact opposite of what A expects whenever A makes an auto-scaling decision, then A will always make the wrong decision for W. Therefore, A will never work for the workload W. So th th this is essentially a proof that shows you can always defeat an auto-scaling algorithm. So what can we do? If there's no perfect solution, how do we come up with a solution? Well, first you have to understand the limitations of your infrastructure. And then you have to understand your workloads and make assumptions about how your workloads will behave. And then if you take these two into account, you can come up with a solution that works well for you. So what are the limitations with our infrastructure? The biggest is that resizing the job introduces processing pauses. When we downscale a router, it typically stops the job completely for a few minutes. This is because the flow we use is to first do a graceful shutdown and take a save point of the router. Then we remove the excess nodes from the cluster. And while this is being done, the job is still stopped. Then only after the nodes are completely removed, do we restart from the save point. So in our infrastructure, removing nodes is expensive. Also adding nodes is expensive. Additionally, when we scale up, there is also a processing pause, but it's not as severe. We circumvent the 
expense of adding new nodes to the cluster by adding the new nodes while the job is still running and only after the new nodes are added do we do a graceful shutdown with a save point and then restart the job. Another limitation with our infrastructure is that there's a two minute delay for metrics to propagate. Now, what are some assumptions we're making about our workloads? One assumption is that it's better for us to over allocate than to under allocate. We don't want to introduce uh, lag accidentally. Also another assumption is that message sizes in our workloads don't change that often. The message content and the message complexity is roughly the same. Another assumption is spikes happen, but not that frequently. It's not like every 20 minutes there's a spike, just every once in a while. Another assumption is that the workloads tend to smoothly increase and decrease. The graph below uh, shows a workload. The gray area is messages in per second on the Kafka topic. And you can see that each day there's a regular pattern of increasing and decreasing traffic and it changes pretty smoothly. So given these limitations and assumptions, what does our solution look like? What characteristics do we want it to have? I wanted the auto scaler to have a minimal amount of state. I didn't want to collect days or weeks of data in order for the algorithm to make good scaling decisions. Also, the algorithm need to be deterministic. If an issue happened in production, I wanted to be able to copy and paste the state into a unit test and reproduce the issue on my laptop. Another property was ease of control. So if we had to add any specific override or rule to do something in a particular situation that needed to be pluggable. Also, I wanted to be able to understand why the autoscaler made its decisions by just looking at the metrics and looking at the policies that we plugged into it. So there are a few approaches available. <clears throat> One that's widely used in Netflix for the API services is his, a historical prediction approach. The historical approach requires collecting a lot of data over the past few days and weeks, and that data is used to predict traffic for the next day or so, and that prediction is used to make scaling decisions. Another approach is the rule-based approach where you define a set of rules and corner cases you want to handle and make scaling decisions based on those rules. Another option is to use a PID controller, which is used by Mantis, Netflix stream processing engine. The issue with the PID controller is it requires low latency metrics and it's difficult to get it to behave well when there's a high latency for metrics, which is the case for us and our routers. So the approach I opted to use was a statistical short-term prediction approach with policies, and I'll go into more details about what this approach actually does. <clears throat> the approach has five high-level steps. The first step is to collect. In this step, we gather a batch of metrics we need to make a scaling decision and we collect these metrics once every minute. After we have the metrics, we apply our pre-decision policies. So these are policies that we've plugged into the algorithm and they can decide whether we can continue making a scaling decision or if we need to abort the auto scaling process for this time bucket. After we apply our policies, we go to the decide phase. So in this step, we decide should we scale the cluster up, should we scale the cluster down, or should the cluster stay the same. This step also collects some performance information about the cluster. Now, after we've made a decision on how to size the cluster, we have to calculate what the new cluster size should be. So we do this in the calculate size step. Then after we compute the new cluster size, we apply post-decision policies. So these policies can modify the size of the cluster we pick, and they can also decide whether to abort auto-scaling. I'll go into more detail for each of these steps now. In the collect step, 
As I mentioned previously, we gather a batch of metrics each minute. These metrics include Kafka messages in per second, CPU utilization, network utilization, and records process per second. And we store some of these metrics in the autoscaler for a short time period. In particular, we store Kafka messages in per second to predict the workload and future steps. After completing the collect step, we move on to the pre-decision policy step. Here we plug in two main policies. The first detects if there are recent task failures, and the second detects if the cluster is currently being redeployed. In both of these cases, we want to abort auto-scaling because the cluster is not in a state where we can make an auto-scaling decision. Then we move on to the decide step. And in the decide step, the criteria for proceeding with a scale up is pretty simple. If there's significant lag and the sync for the job is healthy, then we'll decide to scale up. Or if the utilization for the router exceeds a safe threshold and the sync is healthy, we'll also decide to scale up in that case. Now, a key insight here, and if you remember one thing from this talk, remember this is that if you decide to scale up the cluster, you actually have a critical piece of, in, of performance information. Deciding to scale up means that the cluster is processing as many events per second as it can handle at the current size. This is effectively a benchmark, telling you the throughput of the cluster at this size. And this is very valuable information. So what the autoscaler does is whenever it decides to scale up, it remembers the current throughput and the current cluster size in a performance table. And that performance table is used in later steps to compute the desired cluster size. And I'll describe this in more detail in the performance table section later. Also in the decide phase, the criteria to scale down is pretty simple. If there's no lag and we don't anticipate an increase in incoming messages, we'll scale down. Now, what do I mean by anticipate an increase in incoming messages? So earlier I mentioned that we collect the Kafka messages in per second for a short window of time, and we use that data to predict the future workload. If the workload looks like it will be decreasing or staying the same in the near future, we'll decide to proceed with the scale down. And I'll describe how we do that prediction in more detail in the predict workload section later. Now we're on the calculate size step. In this step, we compute the new cluster size. This step has three subphases. The first subphase is to predict the workload. When we predict the workload, we want to come up with a regression function that can predict what the Kafka messages in per second for our router will be in the near future. After we have a regression function, we can use that to compute a desired target throughput for the cluster that will satisfy our requirements for the next 20 minutes or so. Once we have a target throughput for our cluster, we can use that target throughput to compute our desired cluster size by looking up a cluster size in our performance table that can satisfy our throughput requirement. So how do we predict the workload? If you remember at the beginning of the talk, we made an assumption that our workloads change relatively slowly. Because our workloads change slowly, we can use a standard statistical technique called a regression function, which uses recent historical data for a time series to predict near future values of that time series. I use two different kinds of regression function. The first is a quadratic regression function, which I use to predict the workload when it's in a trough. The second is a linear regression function, which I use at all other points in the workload. The graph on the slide illustrates how regression functions can accurately predict a workload in the near future. The gray area of the graph represents the workload for a real production router, and it's the Kafka messages in per second for a Kafka topic that the router consumes from.
the arrows represent a given point in time and the blue areas represent historical data for a given point in time. The red areas represent a regression function that was computed from the historical data. As you can see, the regression functions match the workload pretty well. Some cases they can be off, but in most cases they predict the near future values for the workload pretty accurately. However, the regression function by itself is not enough. If you remember at the beginning of the talk, one of the assumptions we made about workloads is that they can have spikes. They don't happen often, but they do happen. So we have to have a way to detect spikes. But how do we do this? Well, we first have to compute a regression function. And we assume that the error in our regression function's predictions are normally distributed and centered at zero. We then find the standard deviation of the error in our regression function. Once we have the standard deviation of the error, there's a standard idea in statistics that if a value is more than three standard deviations away from your prediction, it's considered an outlier. So we can reuse that idea here. If we observe a data point in our workload that's more than three standard deviations away from what our regression functions predict, we can consider it an outlier. And if we observe enough consecutive outliers, that's a signal to us that the workload has fundamentally changed and we have to reset our baseline and recompute our regression function using the newest data. Now I'll walk through an example of spike detection. Here is a graph of an example workload. During times zero through five, all the data points we encounter are within three standard deviations of what the regression function predicts. So all the data points are normal and they all get included in our set of historical data that's used to compute our regression function. However, at time six, we encounter a data point that's more than three standard deviations away from what our regression function predicts. So it's an outlier, and it's not included in our set of historical data that's used to compute our regression function. Similarly, at time seven, we encounter another outlier, which is also excluded from our set of historical data and not included in our regression function calculation. However, at time eight, we observe yet another outlier. Now we're beginning to see a pattern that there are multiple consecutive outliers. So we decide that the workload has fundamentally changed and recompute a new regression function by throwing away our old historical data and using the most recent outlier, outlier data to compute a new regression function. So now we have a robust regression function that can predict our workload and take spikes into account. Now we need to use that regression function to compute a target throughput rate for our cluster. Now, how do we compute the target throughput rate? In order to do that, we have to understand the flow that the flink job goes through when it's rescaled. First, the flink job is stopped and then restarted. Then it needs to catch up with any events that have built up in Kafka, and then it has to be sufficiently fast to be able to handle any changes in the workload over a period of time. Breaking this down further, we define four time periods. The first is a restart time, which is the time that the, it takes to stop and restart the flink job. The second is the catch up time, which is the time it takes for the flink job to completely catch up with all the events that have built up in Kafka, as well as process any new incoming events that the workload has produced. The third is the recovery time, which is just the time it takes for the flink job to restart and completely catch up. The fourth is the valid time, which is a time period during which we want the router to be fast enough to process and keep up with all incoming events. Now that we have these four time periods, we can start breaking down the equations for computing the target throughput rate.
So the first step is to think of the two subcomponents that the target throughput rate is made up of. The target throughput rate has to be fast enough to allow the router to recover and catch up with its backlog. So it has to be as fast or faster than the recovery rate. Also, the target throughput rate has to be fast enough to keep up with the workload at the end of the valid time. So we can define the target throughput rate as the max of the recovery rate and the workload rate. Now, what is the workload rate? Well, the workload rate is just the rate at which messages are coming into the job at the end of the valid time, which is just our regression function with the time T3 plugged in. The recovery rate is just the total number of events the job sees during the recovery time divided by the catch-up time. And then we can break down the recovery rate even further by computing the to total number of events. The total number of events is broken into two components. It's just the events that have built up in Kafka at the beginning of the recovery time and all the new events that come into the router during the recovery time. We can compute all the new events that come into the router during the recovery time by simply taking the integral of the regression function over the recovery time. So this set of equations now gives us all the information we need to plug in numbers and compute a target throughput rate for our cluster. The next step is to use our target throughput rate along with the performance table we mentioned earlier to compute a new desired cluster size. So previously in the decide step, I mentioned that when we decide to scale up, we also save some performance information. This is because when we decide to scale up, the cluster is essentially being benchmarked. It's processing as many events per second as it can with the current node size. And that information is saved and reused in a performance table to make cluster sizing decisions. So here is an example of a performance table and a target throughput rate and how to use the two together to come up with a new desired cluster size. So our performance table has three entries and our target throughput rate is 15,000. In this case, the performance table doesn't have an entry for 15,000, but there are two entries, one above and one below it. So we can do linear interpolation between the two entries in the performance table to come up with a new cluster size that satisfies our target throughput rate. In this case, 15,000 is halfway between 10,000 and 20,000. So we end up taking the average of four and 10 nodes to come up with a new de desired cluster size of seven. So seven nodes should be sufficient to handle a throughput rate of 15,000. There are a few corner cases with handling the performance table. One of them is if our target throughput rate is larger than all of the entries in our table. We compute a desired cluster size in this case by using the last entry in the table to compute uh, events processed per second per node rate, and then we divide the target throughput rate by the events processed per second per node. The result is our new desired cluster size. In this case, the new cluster size would be 21. There are a few more corner cases like how to handle an empty performance table when we're downscaling, but I won't go into all the details here. I also left out another detail, which is that we take utilization into account when computing the new desired cluster size. So our performance table also keeps track of network and CPU utilization. And when we compute the new cluster size, we want the new cluster size to have a resource utilization of roughly 60%. In practice, we've observed that if the resource utilization is too high, if it starts getting into 90, 95%, we start seeing task manager, heartbeat timeouts, and other issues. So the calculations are a bit more complex, 
than what I presented here, but the general ideas are the same. Now you may have noticed that I did not mention anything about scaling up or scaling down during the calculate size step. And this is because the flow and logic for computing the new cluster size in both the scale up and scale down case is essentially the same. There are only minor differences in the implementation details, but the flow and the logic and the ideas are all the same. After we have our new desired cluster size, we apply the post decision policies. These can modify the desired cluster size we computed, or they can decide to abort auto scaling altogether. So during this phase, we apply minimum cluster size and maximum cluster size constraints based on the number of partitions in our source Kafka topic. We also enforce cooldown periods for scale up and scale down. We also disable scale downs during region failovers. And we also set a safety limit for the maximum number of nodes we can add to the cluster during a scale up. And we also set an overall maximum limit for cluster size for a router. After all the post decision policies are applied, we are ready if we decided not to abort auto scaling to go and initiate the rescale action and modify the cluster. Now that we've gone through the auto scaling algorithm, how does this actually run in production? We consider two implementation options for deploying auto scaling into production. The first was embedding all of the auto scaling logic within Flink itself. The benefit of this is that we get much lower latency for the metrics we need. The, there are some downsides though. So if we put auto scaling into Flink itself, then all these resource management layer interactions would get put into Flink. Also, we would have to implement some way of keeping track of all the history of cluster modifications and rescale actions so that we can look at things when we're debugging something in production. Also, if there's a bug in auto scaling, then we would have to update our fork of Flink and redeploy the jobs in order for the bug to be fixed. The other option was to run auto scaling as a completely separate pipeline or job. So the benefit to this is that this separate job could call the Flink as a service control plane to initiate rescale actions. And our Flink as a service control plane uh, already has an infrastructure to make changes to our Flink clusters. Also, if we're reusing the Flink as a service control plane we have, it already keeps a track of uh, cluster modifications and keeps a history so that we can look at things in production if we see an issue. Also, another benefit is if auto scaling has some bug or has some upgrade, uh, it's a separate service. It can be updated separately and it doesn't impact any existing Flink jobs that are running. The one downside is that our metric system at Netflix does have a metrics delay of roughly two minutes. We decided to go with the second approach of having a Mantis job, which is separate from Flink that runs the auto scaling algorithm. Here we have a high level overview of our architecture. So the flow is that our user routers run on Titus, which is our resource management and container, la container layer here at Netflix. The user routers produce metrics to Atlas, which is Netflix's metric management layer. Then the auto scaling Mantis job consumes the metrics from Atlas and applies the auto scaling algorithm we described earlier. When the auto scaler makes an auto scaling decision that it wants to execute, it calls the Flink as a service API. Then the Flink as a service control plane calls Spinnaker, which is our deployment management layer here at Netflix and Spinnaker then calls Titus to add and remove containers to the user router clusters. So how does this work in production? Before deploying to production, I tested on some synthetic workloads. 
The top graph shows a synthetic sinusoidal workload. The gray area of the graph represents Kafka messages in per second for the Kafka topic that the router consumes from. The bottom graph shows the number of nodes in the router cluster. You can see that the router cluster scales up and down with traffic. I also tested on spiky workloads. So here we have a linearly increasing workload with spikes. You can see that the cluster scales up to accommodate spikes and scales down when there are no spikes. Also, the cluster gradually increases linearly with the workload. Here we have a real production router. You can see that the router has a daily traffic pattern, and you can see that the cluster gets sized appropriately to handle the peaks and trough of the traffic. <laughs> this graph shows the total resource usage of our router fleet in a particular region. You can see that every day, our entire fleet gets scaled up to handle peak traffic and gets scaled down during the lowest traffic hours. We've seen really good efficiency gains with auto scaling. Depending on the region and time, we've reduced our resource usage by 25 to 45%. Also, it's significantly improved our on-call. We rarely get paged for router issues now, and when we do, it's usually an issue with our, the sync that the router is writing to. We're not quite done yet. Uh, if you're running auto scaling in production, there are a few more things that you have to think about. The first is memory requirements. So our routers consume from Kafka and some of them produce to Kafka. And the Kafka consumer and Kafka producer require direct memory. Now, when we launch our Flink cluster, we can't change the direct memory allocation for the task managers after they've been deployed. And the problem is that different cluster sizes require different amounts of direct memory for the task managers. Smaller clusters require each task manager to have more direct memory because each task manager is handling more partitions. Larger clusters require less direct memory because each task manager is handling fewer partitions from Kafka. So the trick is you have to deploy your router cluster with a direct memory configuration that can work for all possible cluster sizes. And what we do is we deploy the routers with a direct memory configuration that works for the minimum cluster size. Another issue we saw in production was partition balancing. So what we saw was that overall a router would be keeping up with traffic, but it would be lagging behind on only a few partitions. And the reason why this was happening is because the partitions were not balanced evenly across the task managers. The reason why this happens is that the Kafka consumer tries to evenly balance the partitions across other Kafka consumers, but it's not aware of the task manager it's running on. So you can end up in a worst case scenario where all the Kafka consumers that end up consuming an extra Kafka partition end up on the same task manager. So here we have an example with three task managers. Each task manager has two task slots and we have a Kafka topic with eight partitions. We can end up in a situation where one task manager ends up consuming four partitions while the other two task managers only consume two. In the general case, you can say that task managers with N task slots can end up consuming from N extra partitions compared to the other task managers in the cluster. So there are a couple ways to handle this you can try to perfectly balance the partitions across all the task managers by making sure that every Kafka consumer consumes the same number of partitions. The problem is that you have to make the number of Kafka consumers evenly divide the number of partitions for the Kafka topic. And that severely limits the number of options you have available to size the cluster. Instead, we chose a laxer requirement Basically, when we see a Kafka partition lagging, we rebalance the cluster such that the maximum number of partitions a Kafka consumer is responsible for will be reduced by one. This allows us to reduce the impact of the imbalance in Kafka partitions while giving us a lot more options to pick for cluster size.
Another thing to worry about is outlier containers. So what we found is even though a router is adequately provisioned, it still would have lag building up in Kafka. And the reason for this is that one of the containers in the router was running on a degraded host. So this is an example of a test router that was running on an outlier container, which was on a degraded host. You can see that the CPU utilization for the outlier container was much higher than all the other containers. And when we had the Titus team look at the host the container was running on, they found that the host had degraded memory and there was a high error rate for reading and writing memory. So the Titus team is working on improving the automatic detection and remediation of these bad hosts. There are more things to consider when running this in production, but we don't have time to cover them all here. So I'd like to quickly talk about some future work we're planning to do. The first is eager scale up. So if you remember when we make a scale up decision, we decide to scale up when lag has already built up for the router. This isn't ideal because the latency has already increased for messages in the system. And ideally we would scale up the router before any lag has built up. So we can actually do this using the performance table and the regression function we compute. We can use those two things to anticipate if the router could potentially start lagging in the near future. And if we anticipate lag in the near future, we could proactively scale up before any lag has actually built up. Another thing to optimize is the downscales. So downscales are expensive because we have to stop the job and then wait for the additional TMs to be removed. And only after the TMs are removed can we restart the job. Ideally, we would be able to stop the job, blacklist the TMs we want to remove, and quickly restart the job in a way so that it's not scheduled on the blacklisted TMs. Then after the job is up and running, we can execute the expensive operation of removing the blacklisted TMs from the cluster. Also, the biggest future work item is extending the algorithm to complex DAGs. Currently, we only support routers, which are very simple. They consume from a single Kafka topic and write to a single sync. We'd like to support DAGs that consume from multiple sources and write to multiple syncs. We also want to support more complex topologies where all the operators are not chained together into a single subtask. Also a quick shout out to everyone who's helped with the project and check out Netflix's open source Spinnaker project as well as Netflix's Mantis open source stream processing project, which is optimized for operations use cases. Thanks again.